Good afternoon. Wasn't that lovely? Uh, and, and my word, he was inspiring. Where's he gone? He said he would stay and listen to mine. Hi, Gregoire. That was very good. Um, I, I work at the top of the brain, and I've spent most of my time at the top of the nervous system in the brain. Um, and I, I want really to use um, problems of the brain to talk to you about the future of medicine. Um, I'm, I'm reaching a t retirement, so it's a time when old men start thinking about the future of medicine so that they can keep the young men back down. Um, but but it, it really is a problem, at least a problem for me, because dementia is something that affects my family. It's undoubtedly something that affects your families. As our population gets older and older, so more and more people live with dementia. 20% of people at the age of 80 have some serious cognitive deficit, meaning they need some looking after. So this is, this, is a, this is not a trivial problem. This is not a perhaps problem. This is not something Mr. Bush could put under the carpet and say it doesn't happen. It's actually there and it's with us. And, and we need to deal with it. And the, 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 the problem I have is that I've lived through dementia. Uh, when I first met dementia, it was called senility. And then I met dementia and it was called vascular disease of the brain. And then someone said, no, no, it's mixed vascular disease and degeneration. Then other people said it was degeneration. And then they started talking about Alzheimer's disease. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go and read about Alzheimer's disease. So I went to the 1903 book and it was in German. So I had to find a... I had to find a translation, but the really interesting thing about it was Alzheimer described three cases, and that's why it's called Alzheimer's disease. And these three cases were very interesting because they were certainly causes of dementia, but one of them definitely, and the other one possibly, were caused by syphilis. Now, in retrospect, when we look at the pictures. So here was dementia, caused by probably the most common cause of dementia at the time, an infection, syphilis. And of course, that dementia was not a disease at all, it was a syndrome. Now, what is a syndrome? Well, a syndrome is what happens when a patient comes to see a doctor. The patient tells you what he or she thinks is important. And sometimes the relatives adds a few things which are usually not very important. And then you, the doctor, sit there and with all your experience and knowledge and wonderful training, you write down what you think is important in what the patient thought was important and you remove the bits that are inconvenient. And then in the times of Alzheimer, you would write it in beautiful ink on, on parchment paper, you would put it on your desk or inside your desk and after about five or six years, when you had seen three, you would take them out and you say, these look the same. You would write them up and you would send them to an editor and you would say, I'd like you to print this paper about my disease. And so the editor would say, okay. And there you would have your disease, Alzheimer's disease in this case. The problem is that this was not a disease. This was a syndrome. This was things that come together, loss of memory, loss of the ability to act, loss of the ability to think, loss of the ability to look after yourself. It was a syndrome, and we have continued to live the medicine of syndromes in many cases for a long time. Now, with syphilis, the situation was very interesting because a drug was found, penicillin, syphilis stopped, and the dementia of syphilis disappeared, but other dementias arrived. And we took on the same view about these dementias, that we could knock them out with a single magic bullet, just like penicillin knocked out syphilis. And so what I'm trying to do is to make a very simple distinction, the distinction between lots of things which we can describe, uh, which is called a syndrome, and a disease, which is a mechanism that leads to that syndrome. And one of the problems we have with the brain is it's been very difficult, apart from infections, to deal with mechanisms of disease in the brain. And the reason for that is that we've only been able to look at the sick brain after death. 
Now, if you had liver disease or heart disease or gut disease, doctors put tubes into you and they take out bits and that's fine. They look at them under the microscope and they begin to work out what the problems are. With the brain, that's not really possible. You have to drill holes. I mean, it's okay for taking out big tumours or possibly treating epilepsy, but you can't do it on normal people and see what the normal stuff looks like, for starters. And the second problem that we learnt about only recently is that the disease changes the brain. So we heard about plasticity where the brain recovers. But the brain recovers by changing itself, rewiring itself. So a diseased brain is not like a normal brain. And it was on until the Annus Mirabilis of 1973, when scanning came along, that we began to see inside the brain. And for us, this was absolutely remarkable because we could see, the, for the first time, pathology within the brain. And it was not only pathology, you know, what was wrong with the structure of the brain, but very quickly, by 1978, 79, we could also work out what was malfunctioning in the brain and in the different parts of the brain. And that was PET scanning. And then along came magnetic resonance imaging in 1990, and that was absolutely fantastic. So we suddenly had the possibility to look at the brain before it died. And that changed really everything. So, what have we been doing now? What's happening now is that we're seeing medicine being transformed from an art, which is where we empathize with people, we listen to them, we help them, we sympathize, we try to organize treatments. And on top of that now, not instead of, but on top of that, we bring in science. We bring the science which essentially says, how has this come about? And when we find out how this comes about, then we'll have some indication of what to treat. Because for the moment, we have none. Now, just recently, in the last 10 years, I'll show you later on, there have been some major changes, not only in science, but also in technology. Which, for me at least, means that there are going to be amazing things happening over the next 10 or 15 years. But before that, let me just show you what imaging has contributed to our understanding of dementia. The first thing we've been able to do is to see that different parts of the brain are sensitive to pathology in different ways, in different people, and that the parts of the brain that are affected sort of sculpt the syndrome that comes up in those patients. So here you see some areas in blue. These are called the temporal lobes. They're usually affected by language. So that people who develop a, a dementia that affects language initially usually end up with a disease known as frontotemporal dementia or a progressive aphasia. There are other people who, in red, that's where the primary area of loss of function occurs. These tend to be people who are amnestic and who also, in other words, they, they don't memorize properly, also don't use their hands properly, their actions are difficult. These are people who usually turn out to have Alzheimer's disease. And then there are other people in green who have other diseases leading to dementia. Just like syphilis used to lead to dementia, we now know there are five or six or seven different diseases leading to dementia. But the trouble with these images is that they're averages. We can't do this for individual people. So we've got a problem there. Another thing that we've managed to do is to tackle the problem of when should we be treating dementia. Some of you might say, well, if you're already demented, then that's too late. How long does it take to become demented? Is it like an infection? You get a bug and then you get feverish and then you become unwell. Or is it something that takes a long time? Well, a number of pieces of evidence suggest that you become demented over a very long time. Tens, 15, 20 years even. People with Parkinson's disease lose 80%, 70 to 80%, of a certain very specific set of neurons on each side of the body before they get the first symptom. So there's an enormous reserve, we call this redundancy. There's an enormous reserve, the sort of reserve that also I suspect helps you in the spinal cord when all those new synapses get formed. It certainly helps after stroke, 
which is why a lot of people recover after stroke without really needing doctors. So we thought we need to find out whether we can detect disease in people who are not demented. And there is a disease that causes dementia called Huntington's disease. This is a genetic disease. It's caused by one mutation. If you have the mutation, you will get the disease by the time you're 40 or 50. So we got some families together. We took simple scans of the brain, of the structure of the brain, and then we divided the scans according to whether they had the mutation or did not. They would get the disease or not, but they were all quite normal. They were working. They recognized each other as normal and so on. And here on this image, in little yellow patches, you can see areas of the brain that have begun to atrophy, to become small and degenerate in people who have the mutation but are still normal. And they're not, they're not randomly distributed because, again, these are averages. They're distributed in those areas of the brain which the pathologist, after death, will show us are the most affected by this disorder. So we can pick up in groups of people disease which is occurring before dementia has occurred when there is compensation sufficient to keep problems away. So we had to move from groups to individuals. So that's what we did about four or five years ago. We began to use some very sophisticated mathematical and statistical tools in order to look at the patterns in the images of the brain themselves. Essentially what we were trying to do was to classify images into those of people with Alzheimer's disease and those of people without. So let me just explain what I mean by classify. In this image you can see there are two axes. There are some people in circles. Let's call them the, de the demented people, group A. There are some people in little squares. We call them group B. They're the normal people. So you can see we could divide them up by drawing that line labeled boundary. And that boundary is like a sort of diagnostic line. It classifies you into Alzheimer or non-Alzheimer. And that's very easy to understand. Some of you might understand it if there was a third dimension there, or even a fourth one over time, how this evolved over time. But now one of these images that I take of the brain contains 100,000 little elements. That's 100,000 dimensions. You can't imagine that, nor can I. We have to use information technology. We have to use computers to work out the boundary. And the boundary won't be a straight line. It'll be some squiggly function, squiggly line, which will put people into the right area. So what we did was we went and got some images of patients. We went around the world to our friends. And we needed to be sure these were patients who had Alzheimer's disease and not some other disease causing dementia. And more importantly, it's something no one had ever thought of before, we needed to make sure that the elderly people who were normal didn't have compensated Alzheimer's disease. So we said to people, please give us your images of people who have had pathology, who have died already. And then we brought them together and we constructed a machine from them, a categorization machine from these exemplary images. And then we took other images and said, well, which way do you fall? And the results were really quite stunning because AD is Alzheimer's disease. If you look at the third line, AD and controls in the third group, these are people who were just clinically diagnosed. Alzheimer's disease is misdiagnosed one in five times in the hospitals of the world today misdiagnosed. So there you see an 81.1% correctly clarified. That's one in five wrong. So these were just the clinically diagnosed one, and we got what we expected. Then we took the ones in group one and group two, and we found out how the machine worked, and it worked 95%, 100% sensitivity, 95% specificity. One image was good enough to outdo standard clinical diagnosis in the best possible hospitals. Now, what does this mean? This means that we can potentially find small groups of people who are either normal or Alzheimer's, and we know they have that disease causing dementia, and we know they're completely normal, and we could do drug trials on small groups of people, 15, 20, 30, no more. The trials that have been done over the last 10 years have been of 3,000 people versus 3,000 people. Expensive. 
because we didn't know whether the diagnoses were right. So how can you test lots of drugs on 3,000 new people every time? So this sort of work should potentially help us discover ways of creating clinical trials which are much more uh, uh, informative. The conclusion we have is that we can't tr treat disease if its mechanism is not known. A syndromic diagnosis is just absolutely too imprecise. And therefore, we have to go further. So to go further, what do we need? We need science. And this image, you don't have to look at it, really. There's just lots of scientific techniques for looking at models of the diseases, for looking at the whole brain scale. There's one of those rats down there, bottom left. For the tissues at the cells, even below the cells at the genes and so on. Lots and lots of information out in the world, but nothing really to bring it together. And the challenge of the future, a challenge which Lausanne and the Le Manicarc is taking up, is to try and see whether we can bring together these data with the clinical data to start finding mechanisms and to start finding real drug targets. Not blood pressure, not uh, treating vitamin deficiencies, not acetylcholine, not uh, amyloid, which people have been playing with for the last 10 years. They've even been vaccinating against amyloid, which is lovely because there are other examples where you're well, someone vaccinates you, don't get the disease. It'd be nice if you could do that with the disease causing dementia. But the trouble is that everything we know about the diseases now comes from individual bits of study and people latch onto it and then spend large amounts of money trying to make that better rather than the disease better. We need to know the real mechanisms. This is amyloid. You can see on the top right, normal pattern of a tracer of amyloid. On the bo bottom right, you see the same pattern in someone who's got a bit of cognitive decline but not really demented. On the top left, you see Alzheimer's disease, lots of red and green and yellow, a lot of amyloid. But the one below that is also someone who's only very mildly affected, already got lots and lots of amyloid. On its own, it's not telling us anything. So we need to shift. And the shift comes from computer power, Moore's law, the fact that we can now crunch numbers a go-go, from database technology, I'll just say Google and Facebook, and you'll know exactly what I mean, from the Human Genome Project, which is now a book which we can read the genes from, from the sort of imaging and more advanced imaging that I've been showing you, and from completely new mathematics, which has come out because of the power of computers, because computers have allowed mathematicians to think in higher dimensions. Bring all those things together, and we have what's called medical informatics. The roadmap is to take all the available data to f about a particular disease, federate it, mine it with these new algorithms and technologies, in a causal fashion, looking for causes, not just correlations, and the causes are biological causes. And they, therefore, give you the biological signatures of the disease so that you can take those signatures to a biochemist and say, what is the abnormal system here? To the geneticist to say, what's the genetics underlying that? To the doctor to say, what is it clinically that defines these people who have the same mechanism? To the pharmacologist to say, which of your drugs together will modulate this abnormal system and slow down the degeneration? Then we can go into real clinical trials. Then we can use perhaps the whole population to do those trials. I think that's the sort of future we're talking about. I strongly believe that this is a tipping point uh, in the history of medicine, certainly in the history of neurology. And I'm uh, very happy I've still got a few years ahead of me in life rather than in my profession to see it all happen. Thank you very much.